in the meantime cause some mayhem. All right, so I think everyone can hear me, right? Um, excellent. So thank you so much for having me and thank you to Michael for making the connection uh, here. So I would like to uh, start by discussing why birds are awesome. They were awesome in the ancient world too. Um, so this is the aspect I take. I'm a professor in classics um, and I study uh, ancient religion. My specialty is in fact ancient myths and how the ancients uh, viewed the world and thought about what surrounds them. And animals are actually a great way to explore this, right? To explore how you think about humans within the world because of every other living being that's surrounding them, right? So that's sort of my, uh, my point of contact. So I will start by telling you a few stories since we're talking about mythology. Um, Let's see how that goes. All right. So what are we looking at here? Uh, this is from the 6th century BC, and this is in Tarquinia, so uh, the region just north of Rome, very close to the border with Tuscany. Uh, 6th century BC, and this is an Etruscan tomb, but we know that at the time the Etruscans are highly influenced by Greek culture, so there's many points of overlap here. And what are we looking at is this wonderful fresco we have these birds sort of flying off, uh, a wonderful aquatic bird here. One is diving into the sea, and we've had this dolphin uh, springing out of the, of the waves. Um, and it's very interesting in terms of its movement, right? It's talking about a world really alive with living creatures, uh, also with movement and colors, right? Uh, and let's remember that this is in a tomb, right? So that's really interesting. And I'd really like to point out this, bird's, uh, this bird plunging uh, into the sea uh, while the dolphin is coming out, because on the uh, next wall of the tomb, we have this, um, which continues this wonderful fresco of birds flying off in every direction. They're very colorful. Uh, but this time, we have a human uh, diving into the sea, right? And it's thought that the symbolism here is that this person is making this transition between life and death. That's the purpose of a tomb, right? It's the point of contact between worlds. Um, and he's doing so uh, amongst all these other li living creatures, uh, especially birds that are very prominent here. And so the birds are really making contact between different worlds by making contact between different elements. Remember the one that diving into the sea and we have the dolphin diving out and here we've got this person uh, making this transition as well. So it's really interesting how here this person uh, is making this transition between uh, uh, life and the afterlife surrounded by creatures that symbolize and sort of reinforce uh, the notion of what's going on. Um, so very interesting in terms of thinking about the place of humans in all of this and, and how uh, everything is very connected among these living creatures. Let me tell you another story. Uh, this one is in the Odyssey, which you may be familiar with, uh, the adventures of the hero Odysseus uh, after the sack of Troy, trying to return home. And it takes him an extremely long time, and he makes just about every god angry on the way. Um, in book five, he is desperate. Um, he is pursued by the wrath of the gods, uh, in particular Poseidon, uh, which you can see uh, in the back there on his chariot. Um, and Odysseus is on a raft. He's alone at this point. He's lost all his companions. He's just about to drown in this horrible storm. And the goddess Leucotia uh, comes up to him. And Leucotia means white goddess. It's perhaps in reference to the sea foam, right? She's a marine goddess. And she comes and she gives him a veil, which you can see she's handing to him here. Uh, and this veil is magical and allows him to reach safety uh, in, on land. And he's going to go to the island of the Phaeacians, which eventually allows him to return home to Ithaca. Um, and I'd like to really point out uh, the figure of the goddess here. Um, this is from the 16th century, but I think it really represents well the spirit of the scene. Uh, look at her body. 
she's a uh, marine bird with um, web feet. Um, very interesting. Uh, what can that possibly mean? If we look at the text of the Odyssey, um, we have the, um, we have the uh, translation here. So uh, Eno, daughter of Cadmus, uh, she used to be a mortal, but she now is a goddess. And she appears uh, to Odysseus because she takes pity on him. And she rose up from the deep, so she came out of the sea, like an Aethria. And now that's a good question. What does that mean? Aethria is actually the Greek word that appears in the Odyssey. It's clearly a bird, but uh, what kind of bird is uncertain? Uh, let's look at other places where Aethriae come. Um, this is an epitaph, right? So it's the text that you put on somebody's tombstone. Uh, this probably dates somewhere around the third century BC. And what we have here is a man named Erastatus um, who died in the sea. Um, and this is a tomb that was set up uh, in exchange for a real tomb. And that's really important. The Greeks are extremely particular about burying the dead. If, you, if your body is not buried properly, you do not get to go to Hades. You're going to be a lost soul forever. So there's really a lot at stake here is this person's whole afterlife. So when people are lost at sea, uh, you set up what is called a cenotaph, so a, 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 a surrogate tomb, right? And that's what this is supposed to be on. Um, and we're saying, you know, his body um, is not here, and he perished along with his ship. Uh, his bones are somewhere in this immensity, but only the ivory eyes know where. So we have this bird again. Uh, and I, I draw your attention to this notion that Eno came to Odysseus just at the time when he was about to die. And here we have the Aethriae sort of watching over uh, this person as they're dead. Uh, and finally, um, something from Arian's Periplus. Arian is a, a Roman historian. Um, and he is talking about an island in the uh, Black Sea area, and this island is called the White Island. Uh, it is supposed to be haunted by the ghost of Achilles, another hero from uh, the Trojan War. And as you know, Achilles is uh, the best warrior, but he tends to have a temper. Um, so that gets him into trouble even in the afterlife. And so um, this island um, is inhabited by a whole bunch of birds. We have Laroi, Aethriae, and Coronae Thalassiae. We're not sure what the Coronae Thalassiae are, but this translates very literally as sea crow. Um, and these birds uh, are in the Temple of Achilles, and their motions are very interesting. They uh, go to the temple and they sprinkle it with moisture from their wings. Now, in Greek culture, that is a ritual gesture of cleansing. Uh, and that's something you would do to the body of the dead. You would also do that to the tomb. So it's a culture where you visit the tomb of your ancestors and your family members frequently. So what the birds are doing is tending, right? Tending the tomb uh, of Achilles in his afterlife. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. I also draw your attention to the fact that the island is called the White Island. Uh, and in Greek culture, white is the color of ghosts. So this is ghost island. So what does all that mean? Um, and how do I find out what this Aethria is, right? And other such birds, right? I know that they're birds. It's really obvious. The Greek word for bird is ornis, and it appears all over the place here. So I know he's talking about birds. But I want to know a little more about the different species that are <coughs> talked about here. Fortunately, classics um, loves this sort of question, and we're very good at compiling data. Uh, this is a, a discipline that's 2,000 years old. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. So we have all these wonderful reference books, among which something called the Glossary of Greek Birds, which I will show you. This is a glossary, so literally it's a list of Greek words that designate birds and you have all the references with it. So this is the first edition from 1895. Fabulous. 
uh, I see my Odyssey reference right there. And we'll get into uh, what this data actually is in a minute. There's a second edition, which is nicer. Uh, it's got images. So in this particular case, he put an images of the great shear water, which um, uh, felt, was felt that it, it is the Aetheria in question. In this edition, in the previous edition, it said, he said it was a gall. We'll get back to that in a minute. There is something uh, that we're calling the third edition for the purposes of this project, and unfortunately, I cannot show it to you, but it is a scrapbook. Uh, it is uh, an interleaved edition of the second edition. So an interleaved edition has a white page after each page, and it was for writing errata and editions and so forth. So Darcy Thompson, uh, the author of this book, kept this interleaved edition from 1936 all the way up to his death in uh, 1948, and he was a collector. Uh, and so he amassed this immense scrapbook, which is preserved and which we are uh, working with now. I will get into that. I just mentioned Darcy Thompson. Who was he? This is him. Um, he was a professor of zoology at the University of Dundee and later St. Andrews. Uh, he's most famous for uh, on growth and form, which some of you may know about here. Uh, he was interested in uh, the development of uh, organisms and talked about the mathematical shapes that govern uh, the development of these organisms. Now, I am not a biologist and I will not expound on that, <laughs> but uh, he was very famous uh, in this book for pioneering uh, scientific illustrations. So the book had a really big influence on artists. It's also common core reading in architecture for that reason. Um, and also uh, got into the big debate about evolution. He's a younger contemporary of Darwin, as you can see. Um, he also, among all these interests, was a very enthusiastic classicist. His father was professor of Greek. And he grew up sort of in the classical uh, tradition and sort of immersed in Greek and Latin literature. Uh, he also spoke about 15 to 20 modern languages fluently. So we're talking about somebody who's extremely proficient at just about everything. <laughs> um, he also he wrote talks in French, which I can evaluate. That's my native language, and the French is actually fantastic. So uh, that's quite impressive. Um, he uh, so contributed regularly to classic scholarship, and he contributed uh, most notably this glossary of Greek bird. He also had a glossary of Greek fishes, which I've consulted extensively. Uh, and he was, uh, towards the end of his life, apparently working on a glossary of Greek plants, which would have been fabulous. Um, so what does that look like? These are some of his scientific illustrations, which you may have seen around. Um, and he was a big believer that you needed to bring all sorts of sciences together uh, in order to uh, put a project together because of the interconnectedness of, of our world, right? So you can't just study classics without any of uh, history, without any of uh, anything else, right? Just like you, he, he felt like you could not study biology without studying mathematics and all sorts of other sciences. He saw a very deep connection between all of these things. And most notably for our purposes, I think, between the humanities and the sciences. He was very interested in how these things intersect. And of course, I uh, cannot approve more of that uh, attitude. Uh, I think that's how we learn best, is by putting ourselves uh, in another territory where we get to learn for real. So what are we doing? Uh, to replicate and to sort of explore uh, his work, we have to put all of this team together. Uh, so, uh, as Michael mentioned, this is an interdisciplinary project, which is mostly happening here uh, on campus. So, uh, there's myself, uh, there's Anthony Bucci from Computer Science, Jennifer Burton from Drama and Dance, she is a filmmaker, uh, Zach Fletcher, who is here today, uh, who is uh, our uh, lead uh, senior developer on the Perseus project, Michael Reed from Bio, uh, Matthew Jaron is the um, he is the uh, person in charge of the Zoology Museum at the University of Dundee, 
where Darcy's collection of specimens is preserved. So you can go and see it. Uh, Matthew has also written extensively on Darcy. Maya Sheridan is the archivist at uh, the University of St. Andrews, so she's in charge of the huge archive. They have 30,000 items uh, of correspondence by Darcy over there. So fantastic resource. And uh, Julia Tua is a uh, junior in computer science. She's been helping with data modeling for this project. So all of these people, and uh, as Professor Reed mentioned, if you want to get involved, we're always happy uh, to have contributions. I think this is a project where uh, everyone can, can uh, contribute something. So what are we going to do about this? Um, and as you can see, I want to know about my idea, but some other questions that are maybe broader and maybe more interesting are starting to crop up, right? So the question is, like, what is this book? And as I worked with it, I started becoming interested with it for itself, right, as an object of study. So we have this really deep data, um, and, uh, and I started wondering, well, so it's this very old book, 1895 is the first edition. How do I bring this into the, uh, the 21st century, right? And how do I uh, work with, with this material that's really encoded for classicists, right? This is clearly an interdisciplinary project from the beginning, from when he wrote it, but it became very limited to classics, and I want to undo that. I'd like for everybody to be able to work with this and to maybe re-contribute to it, because I think there is this something that can be really expanded upon and sort of brought out into the public eye. So how do we do that? Right? Um, so the project is about taking the data that's there, making it, first of all, into something readable for a non-classicist. So that involves fixing uh, abbreviations that are inconsistent and sort of very obscure, involves translations, because, of course, Darcy assumes that everybody is as proficient as he is, so he quotes Latin and Greek without really bothering to tell you what it means, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's that layer. But then after that, we want to be able to analyze this data and bring it out and make something else with it. So what are our challenges? First of all, we got to get down in the weeds and put it into categories. And now I will show you what an entry says. This is our friend Aithria. So lots of categories of, uh, of things appear just from a glance. We start by bird names, and we note that there's bird names in English, bird names in Latin. Sometimes uh, the two are together, sometimes not. We have reasoning, very interesting, and I will uh, say more about that later. But how does he put together these decisions, right? His goal is to grab a Greek name for a bird and then make the reasoning pattern to identify a very specific modern species, right? So very important is the way he's thinking about this and the way he's making these decisions. Uh, modern authorities, so these are biologists from his time uh, who have made uh, identifications or worked on these particular species. Um, and finally, ancient authorities. So these are all the Greek and Latin texts that he could find that have this word in it, right? So first we see our Odyssey passage, then Aristotle. Darcy was a big fan of Aristotle. He actually produced a professional translation of Aristotle's history of animals. So one question is kind of like, is he partial to <laughs> Aristotle? Does he give Aristotle more weight than other things, right? But we see all sorts of things. There's our friend Arian, uh, the Greek anthology, um, all kinds of different things. Antoninus Liberalis, these are, this is a myth, right? So another question that springs up is, does he treat a myth differently than a passage of Aristotle, right? All of these questions are valid if you're going to think about a scientist who's looking at all this material and trying to make essentially a scientific decision. All right. So uh, I am using XML markup uh, to try and parse this out, and our team has been working hard on modeling this data, right? It's one thing to put, uh, to put tags around something, but it needs to make sense in a broader perspective, and we need to be able to exploit this data later. 
So uh, you can see uh, an experiment here, and I say experiment because we're going in iterations over all of this. So I'm tagging birds, and you can see that within a bird tag, there's a Latin name, sometimes there's an English name, a modern authority to sort of talk to us about that bird, and then reasoning. Uh, in this particular case, he's saying that it's not the back, back, black-backed gull because that species is rare in Greece, which seems like a reasonable argument, right? Um, so there's all sorts of, of problems that occur with this, though. So in this particular case, um, he quotes two possible species, and in his original text, he only says that one is rare in Greece, the former is rare in Greece. So in the data, you have to actually separate these two things so that the computer knows that the reasoning statement applies to both of these things. So all sorts of issues uh, of that nature crop up, but it's, it's really quite fascinating to just dissect uh, this data set. Um, so that's part of the issue, uh, and that's part of the project, is to make a data set that's going to be exploitable later. Uh, and we're envisioning an online resource that would present the text uh, enriched with, uh, with linked open data to uh, bird resources and all sorts of classics resources, but also to offer a downloadable version of this data. So if anyone wants to play with it, wants to enrich it, wants to do something else with it, they're free to do so. This uh, text is in the public domain, so uh, there's no issue on that front. Um, Let's talk about his reasoning, trying to think about what, um, what decisions he's making, right? And that gets really at the core of this interdisciplinary question because he's going to use authorities such as myths uh, and authorities such as Aristotle to make uh, a decision on the species. So this is my sort of very um, hacky little table of how he's uh, making uh, a decision. Um, so this is from the first edition. You note that he's using four authorities here, right? Where we have the Odyssey, Aristotle, and um, actually three authorities, and uh, Antoninus Liberalis. The Odyssey is arguably a myth. <laughs> uh, there's Aristotle, and then Antoninus Liberalis is also a myth. It's the story of uh, a woman who leaps into the sea to escape some brigands, and she is turned into an Aetheria. Uh So that's interesting, and, and also it asks all kinds of questions about how that works. So uh, he decided that based on these, uh, on these uh, authorities, it is not a herring gull. It is also um, goes for uh, another species of gull instead. Um, he decides that it is uh, not a diver or grebe or a merganser and is also not a skua. So he finally decides that it is got to be a gull. Um, and uh, it's interesting, uh, he's saying here uh, that the bird, the skua, does not dive. And in the myth, I just said that the woman leaps into the sea. So that seems to be important in his reasoning. So he's like reading the stories and thinking about the actual behavior of this bird, right? So that would sort of lend credence to the fact that he views myths as reflecting at least some parts of an actual reality, uh, an actual bird behavior. Now, second edition, right? Uh, we are now in 1936. Um, somebody named William Ward Fowler wrote an article in the Classical Review um, saying that Darcy was wrong about saying that the Aetheria was a gull. He says it is uh, a shearwater. And the argument that Ward Fowler brings up is very important. Uh, he says that um, Darcy ignored a reference, which was to the geographer Strabo. And Strabo describes a bird who tends a tomb just like we've seen in Arian, tends a tomb by sprinkling it with water, blah, blah, blah. But that bird actually burrows into, uh, into the ground and makes little sort of nests there. And so uh, Ward Fowler suggests that that's got to be a shearwater, which apparently has this behavior. And of course, I leave it to Professor Reed <laughs> uh, to <laughs> make those calls. Uh, but what interests me is that Darcy, um, Darcy accepts 
and actually he will put more on uh, this identification. And note how now we've got all these ancient authorities. So he's going to use more of his set of data that he collected. Um, and so we still have, um, let's see, so we have Strabo brought in by, uh, by Ward Fowler. We still have our Antoninus Liberalis. Um, and we have now Aratus, Theophrastus, Virgil, the Greek anthology, Pausanias, and the Iliad. Um, so interestingly, he's really broadened the scope of his, uh, of his uh, investigation. And he's accepting the investigation, and he says that many other birds called the Erodios and the Memnon actually are probably the same species as the Aetibia. And his rationale is that um, these authorities are reporting same behavior uh, of the Erodios and the Memnon. Uh, you guys may know the uh, story of Memnon, who's the son of the dawn goddess, and is killed by Achilles in the Iliad. Um, and uh, Memnon also has a tomb by the sea, just like Achilles, in fact. And also it is tended by birds that flap their wings and so forth, right? So that seems to be uh, sort of a common, uh, common ground here. Um, and so according to Darcy, uh, these are the same birds. Same thing for the birds of Diomedes. Uh, you may know Diomedes, another hero of the Trojan War. Apparently, he's got the same flock of birds tending his tomb. So that gets interesting. We have these dead heroes, and um, their tombs are being tended by these flocks of birds, um, which also, to me, um, brings up the connection with the poem we saw earlier, right? The epitaph, which was saying, only the Aitriai know where your bones are. Maybe the Aitriai are taking care of this, uh, of this person, right? Sort of floating around in the sea. Um, I think also of our passage of Eno, right? Sort of tending Odysseus just as he's about to die, right? That's when this bird intervenes. Very interesting moment uh, for this to happen. Uh, and it's interesting to know that in ancient times, there was a very important temple on Samothrace, uh, which uh, celebrated the cult of the great gods. And this cult was very focused on saving people from shipwreck. And the initiates would wear a sort of shawl, uh, which was supposedly uh, said to mimic the shawl that Eno you know, gives to Odysseus. So I think that's very interesting. And it's supposed to preserve people from shipwreck. So, um, now this uh, Aitria has become a shearwater, um, and that may be interesting to note. I don't know if I can play this audio. Let's see if I can get that to work. Um, I don't think that's going to work, unfortunately. Uh, that's very unfortunate. I encourage you to look up this bird and to listen to the call. Um, you will see that it's a very haunting song, uh, it sounds like, I don't know, children in really bad trouble, something like that. <laughs> um, and interestingly, also, I am told that the shearwater is most active at night. So think about this if you are on a ship on the very, very dark black sea, uh, and it's night, and you hear these very sort of haunting cries, you know that you're near the haunted island in the tomb of uh, all these dead heroes you may just make that connection, right? Um, and this also, um, this image shows us a bird that's white underneath and sort of blackish on top. If you ever saw this bird, you wouldn't quite know the color. And I've noted that in all the sources, we're not told whether it's black or white <laughs> uh, or any other color. So this bird is essentially a cry in the night. Um, and I think that's very interesting for our stories where we're talking about all these people who disappear into the sea or are being tended uh, by these birds. So um, that's our friend Darcy. And this is the type of thing we can find out by ana uh, analyze, analyzing this work uh, in more detail, right? And as a classicist, obviously, I'm very interested in knowing more uh, about what these stories mean, right? That's my work, that's my daily bread. Uh, but I also think that we have an opportunity here to bring 
all kinds of sciences together uh, to really make something new of this work and build bridges amongst ourselves. Um, and also to uh, reach out to a general audience. Mythology, I find, is a great way to reach out um, and to think about, well, how can uh, this knowledge serve a broader, uh, a broader audience? So that's the challenge here. And sort of thinking about how do I make the connections that I just explained to you uh, visible for somebody who's using an online resource? How do I make them able to bring out those connections for themselves. So uh, with my colleague Anthony Bucci, we've been exploring formal concept analysis, which is a way to draw connection between different attributes of an object. And I think I have um, an example here. So you would make a spreadsheet like the one I just uh, showed you, and um, you would define attributes of these different objects. So in, for instance, uh, a cow has four legs, um, a zebra does as well, and so does a lion, right? So they would all have the four legs attribute. Um, and if you go on the other hand here, uh, a duck, a goose uh, swim, whereas a hawk does not, but they fly. So uh, reading this lattice, you could sort of see the connections there between different objects. And so we're envisioning um, having these birds on similar lattices. Right? And so you could grab, for instance, the birds that are related to tomb tending, right? Or the birds that are uh, related to the goddess Athena or other such, right? Because these things come up in the data. So I did a beautiful spreadsheet here of our friend ITBI, and I know that's not legible, but I will tell you that there's 36 uh, ancient authorities in there. So I read the stories carefully and just sort of extracted anything that seemed significant uh, and just put it on the spreadsheet. And as you can see, various attributes are shared. So for instance, these stories all talk about the hero Memnon. Uh, these here all explicitly say that this is a seabird. These stories explicitly say that it nests in rocks by the sea, etc. right? So, just sort of trying to draw connections um, and eventually to be able to have interactive content that will sort of uh, draw out these connections. My hope is for people to be able to search for something that interests them and be able to bring that out just kind of the way that I'm doing it manually um, in a sort of uh, uh, ad hoc way, I'd like to sort of formalize that a little bit. Um, another thing we're doing is working on short films. I mentioned my colleague Jennifer Burton in Drama and Dance. Uh, we are working on producing short films that will feature um, specific birds from the glossary as well as project team members sort of explaining our work and thinking about these birds. Uh, this is a great way, I think, to reach out to a broader audience by just sort of using the medium of film. Um, there's so much visual potential here as well with the birds being so beautiful and, uh, and so much ancient art to bring out, etc. So we are working on that. We went to Scotland in June to gather footage, so stay tuned. Uh, this will come out uh, soon. Um, and here's sort of an idea of maybe what that might look like, right? So if you land on this resource, you might find lists of birds, so a way to, to search for what content you might be interested in featured birds, featured, um, featured groups of myths. So for instance, here we could talk about diving. There's lots of myths that have to do with diving. They don't all talk about the same thing, but they're all related also in some ways. So that's interesting to explore. Uh, you could search by ancient text. So if you were interested in Homer, you could see what content may be related to Homer. Uh, and an individual bird page might look like that. And these would be graphs, right? So that is a sort of placeholder, but it would be sort of showing the glossary text uh, of both editions. You could toggle uh, between them uh, and then some interactive content there. Um, so um, as you can see, there's lots to do with this project. Um, and this is just basically getting started. So I would love for some feedback, and I would also love for people to get involved if they uh, if they're interested. So thank you very much.
turn this. Should we keep Harry Potter? Yeah, you can leave them both out. Okay. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I was truly blown away by the interdisciplinarity of this project. This is, I've never seen so many disciplines into a project. And I was wondering if you could get us started by talking a little bit about the challenges of speaking different languages between the members of the group. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with the questions? Is that something that somebody come up, comes up with a question and then together find the answers? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and uh, I would love for Michael also to chime in if he wants. Uh, but uh, I think this team has been uh, going, and Zach is here as well. Um, the team has been running very smoothly, where I feel like everybody is sort of bringing things into it, um, kind of as it goes, really. And uh, and I feel like it's it's been a, a very um, uh, open process, where we each explain okay, in my field, this means this, and, and sort of listening in uh, to each other. Thank you very much yeah. for, the, for your talk. Uh, absolutely wonderful. A uh, quick question on, uh, you said that there was uh, uh, the same uh, bird could be called multiple different words. Yeah. Um, I, if I remember correctly from my history classes that uh, the idea of Greece was not actually, it wasn't, Greece, or a bunch of different areas that were different mm -hmm. cultures, things like that. Did that also translate to different languages that could have the same word or the same bird be called different things in different languages? Absolutely. Um, we speak of the Greek world, right? So it's a very broad area. It's from the coast of modern day Turkey all the way to uh, Marseille. Right, which was a Greek colony. So uh, we're talking about really broad swaths of the Mediterranean. Uh, all these people speak Greek. Of course, there's lots of local variation, just like today, right? Uh, from village to village, people may call a bird something different. Um, so that was true in the ancient world as well. Uh, there's lots of local dialects and, and all kinds of things like that. So absolutely. Um, Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. It's Thank great to see an example of the environmental digital humanities, because I think there's a lot of digital humanities, but it's yeah. really fun to see an overlap in that regard. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask sort of about that and how you feel it's situated within other environmental digital humanities, and also to ask how you came to this particular topic within all those things one could study in classics. So I think that might be the journey to this topic yes. and the journey to, to in, into the world of this intersection of the environment and digital humanities might be of great interest to yeah. students considering these intersections. Absolutely. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that I'm very interested in how the ancients view the world around them, and I think mythology is the perfect spot to, to see that because animals have such a powerful symbolism that often they've lost in our world, right? Um, and so my first uh, project was a book where I studied um, conceptions of the sea in, in Greek religion, in Greek imagination. It's called the sea in the Greek imagination. <laughs> and so, uh, as I said, I looked up a whole bunch of the glossary of Greek fishes because uh, dolphins turn out to really uh, play a major role in all of this. Uh, but birds are also very frequent. So I frequented the glossary of Greek birds uh, continually. And, and just kind of became fascinated with it as an object of study for itself. And, um, and I think that that's really how this, uh, this came about. Um, students in my Greek religion class, which I co-taught with uh, Professor Jennifer Isle in religion, uh, also just showed a lot of interest. We had a student artist in that group uh, who was already doing uh, watercolors of birds, and she started sort of integrating mythology into it. So it really just showed me that there was something special to this book, that it could draw people in from so many different backgrounds. So I noticed in the first two editions that mm -hmm. at some points um, the logic behind identifying particular species was that, well, um, this is the, this is how nature works yeah. in the Mediterranean. Um, have you found any places where um, climate change and other environmental changes have 
rendered that kind of analysis suspect and required a, um, a different approach? I think we looked for uh, for such uh, occurrences. Um, I think that that's definitely plausible, and, and I would definitely turn to the ornithologists in our group for that, uh, for the specifics of that. But something I've, I've noticed also, um, and I didn't show you an entry like that, but there's a lot of places where things are mythical birds, <laughs> so that's another type of, <laughs> of climate change <laughs> that really occurred. Um, so he really <laughs> goes broadly. Um, and it is interesting as, an, as a historical artifact, right? He's writing uh, at the very end of the 19th century. So yes, things have, have most, definitely, most definitely changed uh, since then. So that's an angle that I would like to explore um, down the line. One last question. If you had the chance to meet Darcy Thompson, what would you ask him or tell him? Ah, that's, that's a big one. Um, I've been hanging out in his correspondence for a bit, so um, I, I don't know. Um, you know, that never really occurred to me as to what I would ask him. Maybe I think I should ask, you know, um, I think I would ask, what should I teach out of this? Um, he was very concerned with teaching, and he was known as a fantastic teacher. There are plenty of pictures uh, of him actually teaching his class, and he was known as very eccentric. At the time, you know, bringing props to class was really uh, novel, so he would bring, uh, you saw him with the little bird skeleton. Um, he would bring soap bubbles to talk about surface tension and things like that, so he was viewed as very eccentric. Towards the end of his life, he had a parrot. Um, which would follow him around. So in any event, um, I think I would ask him, you know, how, how do we teach the next generation about this? Um, I think he would be concerned with how this gets passed on. Uh, hopefully, we're doing it now. Sounds like it's working. Thank you very much. Thank you. One chair to the back, that would be really helpful for us. Thank you.